All right. Um, this is an oral history interview with Reverend Lester Timms. The interview is taking place in the Archives and Special Collections reading room in the Delaney Brown Library at Oklahoma City University on September 27, 2013. The interviewer is archivist Christina Wolf on behalf of the Oklahoma Indian Missionary Conference Oral History Project. Thank you for joining me today, Reverend Tim. Um, would you please spell your first and last name for the record? Uh, spell it. Uh -huh. L E S T E R. And that last name T I M S. Great. And where were you born? I was born in Oklahoma, and it was at the uh, among the Choctaw Indian Hospital there in uh, Lamar County. Uh, I, I better take that back because I'm not too sure. I think it's Lamar County, but. Uh, Calhoun, Oklahoma. That's, oh. that's where the uh, Indian Hospital would call it. Was there okay. I was born. And so you grew up in Oklahoma? Right. Uh -huh. Never been out of state till uh, I was a over 20. <laughs> oh, wow. Well, our records show that you entered the ministry as a full time local pastor for the Indian Mission in Oklahoma in 1967. Uh, how did you decide to go into the ministry? Uh, 1967, I had thought it was 66. It could have no, been 66. Wait a minute. You're talking about appointment, right? Appointment, yeah. right. It could have been, but there, there again, I thought it was 69. Oh, wow. Well, I might be off. <laughs> <laughs> or we could be off. Right. <laughs> it's the written record. It should so. be in the journal, though. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so what made you decide to go into the ministry? Well, my decision uh, had nothing to do with uh, enter into appointment. Uh -huh. uh, I, you know, everybody gets this spiritual uh, feeling of, you know, the gospel and what have you lead to whatever in life. So that was the start and beginning I, uh, my family, my father and my mother, uh, all belong to a Methodist church among our Indian people, Indian mission at the time. And uh, I was raised up in church, so uh, I had uh, hearing the gospel of how God calls uh, upon different ones. So I in, uh, did the work, local church work, uh, anything they called me to do. Secretary of Sunday School, uh, uh, children's class teacher, and uh, record keeping for other meetings, and, and so on. And then later, when I uh, was about 18 or 19, I uh, did uh, other leadership work, and uh, <clears throat> eventually, uh, lay speaking was my first step to be in the local, you know and had some uh, training that was set up in our district. Uh, through that, I, uh, uh, that was my first step. And uh, still never had dawned on me about, you know, pastoral. Well, that was for, you know, the guys who uh, up in age and older. And uh, uh, there was no point for me, you know, there. I never thought of it. And I was a life speaker, finishing up one year and the second year, uh, the pastor talked to me about uh, attending uh, the schools we had going within our district uh, to uh, start in uh, uh, local preachers. Uh, you had to be in that class or school for a couple of years before they did that. And I, I told him, I don't think I'm, I'm ready for that. You know, I was a lay speaker, and that's fine. So were you a lay speaker in yeah. the your Talahina church? No. Uh, that's the end of the hospital where I was born. But, oh, okay. But our church is over in Choctaw County, which is about almost 100 miles away. Uh, oh, wow. Maybe 70, 80 miles from Talahina. Anyway, <clears throat> uh, 
our church was one of the church of the sixth church a circuit and uh, the pastor can continue to you know talk to me about you know you did good for lay speaking you ought to go to the school for a license to preach uh, become a local preacher at that time so i i did that for two years and a third year i got my license under bishop uh, Angie Smith, mm -hmm. and, and then uh, uh, I thought that that was going to be it. Well, uh, I think it was about two years, maybe three years later, that's when I entered, you know. Uh, I mean, the district superintendent talked to me about it. Uh, mm -hmm. What would you, how would you feel serving a church? I mean, a pastor of a church. I said, I don't think I, I can do that, you know. Uh, in the first place, I said, I don't have enough education. I think it, uh, it'd be a good person got education. He said, education really doesn't have all to do with it, you know. That's the only talk we had during charge conference, like uh, what we call a quarterly conference mm -hmm. then. And that came about February. I never seen DS till annual conference, but he had already assigned me to a church. <laughs> and this was yeah, it was surprising. I mean, I was shocked. Uh, I guess I remained like that for about hey, two weeks. <laughs> was this Mitchell Memorial? Yes, that was my. Oh, okay. Uh, I was assigned to that church, and there in that church uh, <clears throat> was a mixture of tribes. You know, uh, I'm from the Choctaw, the southeast corner of. Uh, state and this was uh, uh, mostly uh, Chickasaw country and there were some Seminoles, there were some Creeks, you know, attends that church as well as a few uh, non-Indian. So I was appointed there. Back home I, I started out with preaching uh, all in Choctaw language. That was my language. So I sing, I pray, uh, you know, we have a uh, New Testament, Old Testament, and the Book of Psalms all written in Choctaw. So I, I, I did that. That's what I was doing. So when I was assigned to Mitchell Memorial, I had a time because I had to kind of speak mostly English because we had a mixture of people. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> uh, I had a rough time. I was slow going there because I tried to speak, uh, you know, words in English. Uh, I was not. Uh, uh, very uh, good with it, and uh, uh, anyway, that was my first one. That's how I got started there. And you were there. Um, it looks like through '73, so about four uh, years. Four ago. years, which yeah, right, pretty amazing. Um, did you become more comfortable with the? English and preaching to. Um... I had to practice a lot, and as the years went by, I think uh, I uh, built myself up to where I could do okay. I was a little slow, you know, but yeah, I was. I feel like I. At least no one come and tell me, you know, you, you have a time speaking, you have trouble speaking. No one ever said that. <laughs> no, and when you were a lay speaker, which which church? Were you? Uh, My home church was Hampton Chapel. Hampton Chapel. Mm -hmm. And it's called Roof Circuit. There were uh, six churches. Uh, and it went down to about five when I left. So when you were a lay speaker at the Hampton Chapel, would you also go speak at some of the other churches on I the did. circuit? I uh, did. The pastor uh, used me to two other churches. Uh, two Sundays out of a month. Oh, which and, churches were those? Um, that was, I think it was Hampton Chapel, and the other one was Goodwater uh, Methodist Church, which is within that circuit. And uh, when did you start the lay preaching? Um, that's not reflected in our records, and so I want to be sure to to capture that. Um, uh, it was called uh, Local Preachers. Uh-huh. Uh, that, um, 
And what is the main question? Oh, when you first got your um, certificate to be a lay speaker before you actually went to class for a local preacher. Uh -huh. um, and you were on the roof circuit. Um, right. When did you start actually doing the lay speaking? Well, my lay speaking, I was uh, received that in the year three year about three years prior to my assignment, uh, which you At have Mitchell. six sixty seven. Yeah. So it was three years prior to before I started Mitchell. Oh, okay. And also during this period that you were at Mitchell was the infamous trip to Atlanta for General Conference. Right. That was in 1972. That's right. Um, could you tell us a little bit about well, that? There's a lot of story about that okay. because uh, uh, when I was licensed and had the Church of Mitchell Memorial, I was new and uh, through all the shock that I had to go through because uh, I was a district superintendent had uh, visited with me a little bit more and enlightened me what's going to happen at the conference. Nothing like that happened except that one time in February or March when he says, uh, how would you feel uh, to serve a church? And I told him that uh, I feel like that was impossible for me. You know? So I thought that came out of the question. But I I was appointed there and uh, I think there was ongoing, uh, had been in process within the conference about uh, possibility of changes they were looking for. Now this was a time, I, I think uh, Bishop Milhouse came out of the EOB and appointed to be a bishop in our in the Methodist Church, and uh, starting out his leadership among uh, somehow uh, things uh, is not quite different than what it used to be. <laughs> I don't know what it was, but the leaders in our conference uh, they were talking uh, very strongly about. Uh, making a move to some type of provisional conference. So I saw that. But I thought that was this was uh, the usual thing for the pastor. I didn't know any better. So I participated, took part in it. I, there were various uh, meetings set up, you know, here and there where uh, our conference leaders call all the uh, local preachers, ordained, and some uh, laities, uh, to talk to them about, you know, their uh, have a, possibly a discussion, a dream about uh, making a change, uh, if it is all possible. I mean, just open discussion about uh, how to go about and who they're going to try to contact, and so on. And this was moving from um, the Indian Mission of Oklahoma into... Into uh, some type of conference. The shoot was uh, to become a provisional conference. I think that states in the journal, I mean, uh, the discipline uh -huh. back then. So whatever that provisional conference meant still would be tied to uh, national division, as it was called then, which is a global ministry now. Now, <clears throat> still they would uh, receive some help from them. Of course, at that time I come in, it wasn't much, you know, anyway, from, uh, as far as uh, finances. Uh, so the idea was to make some kind of move. I think what they were also talking about was to have most of our conference leaders uh, to be uh, indigenous, which meant, I guess, um, our own, among our own native, uh, rather than having uh, outsiders, you know, <laughs> it, it's kind of thing. Uh, that went on. I, I think uh, uh, at the time Bishop Milhouse was new too in the Methodism, uh, but he wouldn't 
uh, too happy with uh, what was going on, I think. Because you know. uh, at one time, uh, <clears throat> Thomas Roughface, who was uh, one of the conference leaders at that time, he was starting out in the leadership real, real good because he had uh, uh, a little work alongside with Dr. Atchison. So uh, he was doing all right, but in conversing with Bishop, what uh, he would like to see happen uh, about changes into mostly uh, uh, indigenous people, and uh, uh, Bishop was not too happy with that. So I think this this went along all the way to even uh, the year when <clears throat> uh, it got stronger and involved in uh, outside of our conferences uh, uh, about inquiring how to take a step to make changes to become a provisional conference. And I heard so much about the provisional conference, which had, uh, you know, you could ordain your own people among the area within the conference and still be under the guidance uh, of the mission program of the church. So that's what they were kind of shooting for, but uh, somehow, um, since uh, Bishop Milhouse is from the uh, EUB church, uh, within the EUB church there was a missionary conference, which seemed to our guys that that would be just fine too. You know. So they made that move. So was that the Native American leadership that made that move, or do you think that came from Bishop Milhouse? Since Bishop Milhouse was from, I don't know whether he might have been for it because mm -hmm. he, he would understand more what the missionary conference was. You know, he's from that uh, conference, I would, I would guess. But as far as provisional conference, uh, you know, it, it seemed like we, we heard that it was pretty much, would operate pretty much the same, but Missionary Conference was new, uh, along with a uh, merger of mm -hmm. uh, the Methodist Church and uh, Evangelical uh, United Brethren, I think it was. So, uh, we pushed for that, but it, we run into another wall. Oh, you had to that? have a certain number of ordained ministers who would become member of that conference. And at that time, the figure was you got to have some, something like 25 ordained elders that could be a full member. And uh, we didn't have, you know, we had more than that. But none of those except three had a background of seminary. Oh. And the rest of them didn't have a seminary background. So that became a problem. And so the, begin, the work began, you know, contacting some of the programs that uh, Perkins, which is closer to us, in Dallas. So <clears throat> they start uh, talking to some of the leaders, I guess. And uh, there was a guy who had uh, a program as a director of the summer uh, special program that is called Course of Study School, which is still going on today. And his name was uh, Klaus Roths. And they brought him to different parts of our conference, talked to pastors, what kind of programs they had. So um, they started working on this. And uh, the first year we went, all of our pastors, we had uh, somewhere in the 60s you know, number mm -hmm. of pastors. And some of these guys, several of them, even from my own area, uh, Southeast District, <clears throat> uh, they can't speak English, I might say. In fact, one of them uh, uh, uses only, you know, Choctaw uh, in his reading. So uh, they had a time on our first year because they went to, but they went, you know, when the conference decided to do this. And 
some of the pastors who were leading us uh, uh, to see the changes that might happen felt pretty good about it because uh, that was encouraging us even though they can't preach in English they attended school we had to have special uh, reading class set up for for them uh, through the school and so they made it how long of a process was was the course of study to uh, within our conference or mm -hmm. to us? get your um, elders with the seminary background in order it, to qualify. When I look back, because this was, like I say, it, it seemed like it was going on when I came in. And to the time we ended up in Dallas for school, and then comes this uh, general conference. And what happened was after we went to Dallas, either after that first year, the second year, I don't know which, but uh, <clears throat> there was a... Uh, 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 extended program that took place here on OCU uh, where professors from Dallas Perkins would come mm -hmm. out and teach uh, either one course or two uh, in, in January first week and second week during the time the school is out for the winter you know. uh, and we did that and that was to to push us to have one year of school, and uh, in two years, the uh, the extended program would push us to one more year extra, you know, and mm -hmm. so on, speed us up towards that general conference uh, that was coming up, <clears throat> which is uh, 69, 70, 71, 72. So I'm talking about that year where there's one, two, maybe three more years before general conference. And they were shooting for this uh, possibility. So I, my guess is, either one more uh, sessions of school we lack before finishing all of that. But I think the general conference, you know, because of what we were doing, in order to attain that uh, uh, seminary background, mm -hmm. the general conference somehow went ahead and granted us to be a missionary. So you went from lay speaking, telling your district superintendent, not for me, the local preacher, to being assigned to suddenly going into seminary, getting fully ordained, and then you go off to general conference in 72, and that was in Atlanta, Georgia. Right. Can you tell us about your experiences <laughs> there? Oh, yeah. Uh, there were several cars now. I know some people that went. Uh, I may not name all of it, but I was thinking over and I had a name for it, uh, that went. We didn't have no bus, no chartered bus or anything like that. Every one of those that had uh, a good car, you know, they are not afraid to drive a distance, uh, is the one that took. And took with them one or two people, because it's going to be a long drive. and. Uh, we were, as far as I can remember, asked to take some bedding with us, you know, like uh, uh, two quilts or three, uh, two to make bed and one to cover, and uh, a pillow. That was our uh, sleeping. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> there were several cars going. So I, I rode with the Reverend Lee Chupko. Creek uh, ordained mm -hmm. pastor at the time and a uh, layperson. There were three of us in the car. His name was Elmer uh, Berryhill. They took turn driving, you know, from we left from Henrietta, Oklahoma to uh, I believe it was Memphis where we stopped at the Methodist Church. And uh, next day, we continued on to uh, Atlanta. When we stopped at Memphis, uh, we slept at the Methodist Church, which was prearranged, you know, where we could stop by to rest and sleep. We didn't sleep in motel. We slept on the classroom floor, you know, 
concrete floor. And uh, next morning we continued on to Atlanta and did the same. Uh, there in uh, Atlanta, uh, we arrived at the Methodist Church there. The funny thing was, you know, this was uh, a Peach Tree United Methodist Church on Peach Tree Street. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's where we stayed in that week each night. We slept on that floor. And uh, some of the names, are, I, was, I was looking at it uh, along with, I mean, the rest of them that uh, slept there too. And I'm sure there were others that uh, slept at another place. Uh, <clears throat> and there were by, uh, Bob, Penn's Idley, Thomas Roughface, uh, Reuben I. Haiti, Thomas Long, David Long Sr., Harry Long, Lee Chupko, Forbes Durant, Samson Timms, Lindy Waters, Kenneth Deer, Oliver Neal, Earl Dunson, Nicholas Durant, and there was a vocal layperson which I came to know long about that time. His name was Calvin Chisholm. And we also had Homer Noli, who uh, is originally from, you know, our our mission church, Mission Methodist Church at that time. Uh, he worked along with us. Uh, I think he was stationed in another church somewhere in Kansas, but he helped us along with his knowledge and an understanding about conferences. So uh, those were the people that uh, that went, and uh, I always, you know, from that time on, I, I felt like these guys were, uh, and looking back even, as giants of our Mission Methodist Church. I recognize icon. almost all of those things. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, an icon, you might say, yeah. of, of the beginning of the missionary conference, who uh, fought night and day, they traveled, uh, some of them uh, to Nashville, to, uh, they had brought uh, uh, one guy, I never got his name, uh, but he was from a missionary conference that already had going in Kentucky. Uh, and uh, he came and met with us and explained how they, uh, how that works as a missionary conference to enlighten us, you know, what uh, the missionary conference was like. That was one of the things that happened as it went along. So it was, you know, constant move. We didn't have the funds, but everybody donated what they could uh, on their own, I guess. Uh, and uh, uh, it's kind of hard life when you uh, sleep on the hard floor for a whole week, you know, <laughs> at the general conference. <clears throat> but uh, I think we all came back rather happy people, you know, for a general conference. Okay. We still didn't have no delegates, you know. Well, before mm -hmm. that, we didn't uh, have a delegate to represent us, uh, clergy or lay. So uh, we was out there just like a, a bunch of crowd over where they're from. You know, a lot of them didn't understand <laughs> what's going on. But with our um, delegation that went, you know, was pleased with the outcome when we were granted to be a, a missionary conference. So, did you notice uh, any changes from being from going from a mission to a missionary conference right off, or did it take a I little while? I think it's a gradual thing because everybody kind of had to uh, <clears throat> reorganize. Because with from there to within a year. Uh, we call it uh, uh, conference superintendent now, but at that time it was called general superintendent, where Dr. Edson was. He had to go off. We didn't have any uh, between Bishop and uh, the district superintendent. There were four, four of them. 
so that change came about within, uh, I'd say, about a year after we became a missionary convert. That was the change. Plus, by two years uh, assignment, there were two more program area directors. Uh, there was Frank Wheeler, and there was a lady that worked with us. Uh, I got written down some more, but I, I forget her name. She was from uh, Eastern State, like Carolina, so Pennsylvania, some more. Uh, in fact, uh, during a mission uh, trip to churches uh, to speak, you know, uh, as a local church would request, uh, I met her. Uh, you know, she had been in this conference before. So <clears throat> those three were no longer there. It was replaced with our own natives and gradual thing like that. But uh, during those changes along there somewhere, Tom used to tell us that when our leaders, the ministers who were capable leaders in our conference, uh, were pushing for these changes, the bishop got so upset that he told them one time, he said, y'all just getting too big for your bridges. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what he meant by that. I guess uh, he thought, well, y'all just going to keep pushing like this, you know. I guess uh, he wasn't uh, ready to see that kind of major change, you know, that was, uh, you know, he himself was new, so. Huh. Did he ever come around? Uh, I don't think he did. In fact, uh, uh, he was the less of when we have a conference to stay on the ground, have lunch and supper mm -hmm. or breakfast. Yeah, he never did do that. Hmm. When did, uh, would that be Bishop Hart when you started to see more Just of Just about, the... yeah, uh, Bishop Hart. A little bit more of that, and I think lunch uh, and supper he would be around, you know, to eat along with, you know, the campers. Uh, but since then, gradual change and uh, made it where any bishop that came afterwards, I think, pretty much stayed with our people. Great. So, um, well, wow, after your trip to Atlanta and, and you come back and you're still at Mitchell Memorial and then you go on to um, Paris, Hugo, Jacob Memorial, right. and William Anderson. Right. Um, and then Antlers, Hugo, and the Paris charge. Um, and then he switched to less than full-time local pastor. Right. Um, so, I think... Uh, while I was still at those three churches, Hugo Handlers. Uh, I was a former uh, printer in the commercial printing when uh, they assigned me to a church and uh, the district superintendent told me that uh, you're being assigned as full time so you need to quit working. I quit, but you know, uh, at that time, $150 a month, by all I get was uh, uh, not quite enough for me, my wife, and one kid. You know. <laughs> so uh, later on, I, uh, I went back to work and was part-time from 78 to, I think it was... 86? Uh, 86, right. Yeah, and then um, how did you decide to go back full-time? <laughs> <laughs> that was another step. But, uh, uh, I was working in a print, printing shop there in Ada, Oklahoma. And uh, uh, how much time we had? Oh, how much? Oh, about 10 minutes. Okay. I could finish this part. I was at Ada doing part-time 1978 uh, 
1985, 84, uh, somewhere along in there. The First Methodist Church in Ada, uh, you know, and they were members of the Methodist Church, these guys who run the business of printing. And, and so uh, Bishop Hart was preaching revival at, there uh, in Ada, First Methodist Church. And he knew about me, you know, uh, around Ada and was a printer. And I think somehow a connection was made. So he, he come to visit. That was uh, second, it could have been second time, uh, but he came uh, uh, as the press, the press machine kept running, you know, he came back there and chatted with me a little bit, you know, and uh, he said, when are you going to go come back to you full time? We need you in our conference, you know. I said, well, uh, I understand I'll get back someday, but I don't know. I said, I got bills to pay, and that's why I work on the side, I said. So that was it. But later he calls me, and then uh, they have a meeting going on here in the city. He called me up. I want you to come down. After the meeting, I want to visit with you, and so on. So he he stayed on it. Oh, one day I, I told Bishop, I said, well, uh, Whatever you want to do, I said, I, I know I'm, uh, you know, uh, a Methodist minister and uh, uh, whatever you do, I said, uh, I have to do what, what you want me to do. So I just left it with them, you know. But that was it, you know. I, I sold myself down the river. I, yeah. did, I didn't know that. <laughs> Because then he made you the Southern District Superintendent. Yeah, yeah. And he that charged was, everything. From the time he asked me, when are you going to come back, was his first. When are you going to come back, be a full-time. We need some full-time leadership, he said. And then next time he, he, he meets me, while well, he ran over the same thing again. Until he visited, and the third time or second time, he, he visited with me there at the workplace. So I think it was either that third time or fourth time when he said a district superintendent, uh, they want to make a change. He, did, he didn't say where. And there's a possibility that this might be something that we want you to do. You know? Then I thought, oh, that's too much for me, you know. But anyway, it ended up happening. Seemed like a, from the beginning uh, to be a lay speaker was twisting and turning <laughs> on me to get me in there, you know. And so I guess when I retire, I, uh, you know, I look back. And it's, I think it was a blessing, uh, you know. The Lord truly was present all the way. And if it wasn't for that, you know, I wouldn't be. Well, um, we're almost out of our time, and so I want to be sure to thank you again for coming. And uh, to be here. And I hope that we can continue the discussion uh, further. Do you still plan on attending annual conferences? And oh, yeah. I even attended a uh, pastor's meeting already. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Are they going to rope you back in? No, I hope <laughs> not. Supply? I hope not, but, you know, uh, I didn't mind just being there. I don't want to say, you know, because I miss, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Not on camera anyway. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that's, you know, uh, like I told the conference, and I'll be around, you know. Oh, terrific. I know, our, 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 I guess you threw it, but uh, before we started on that missionary conference, it's in a journal, uh, it's in 1960, 61, 68 or something. Where there was a licensed uh, preachers, it, you had deacons uh, order at that time and elders. There were over 125, 130 people in that category at that time. Mm -hmm. Today we only have about 13, less than 16. Oh wow! And those who are coming in to be a uh, what is called now a local pastor. 
uh, there's about less than 20. So you put them all together, you only have about uh, 50 compared to yeah. 130 at that time. So. Uh, need to do some arm twisting. That's get some right. now, somebody needs to do some yeah. arm twisting. Uh, I remember, even though Melhouse was new and everything else, but one thing I still can recall and hear his voice. He said, whatever you do, when you set your goal, set the goals that's reachable. Don't set the goals that you can't reach. I think uh, I've seen times when our conference pretty much uh, recklessly set <laughs> <laughs> goals, you know, that's uh, few falls away from it before it gets completed. Well. So that's it. There's a lot more. You know. Yeah. Oh, I'm sure. And we'll be talking to you again, I hope. Sure. Any, any time. Uh, let me know ahead of time, and uh, uh, I may locate those journals I was oh, talking okay. about. I, I kept, you know, like, uh, 64, 65, 66, and all of that. It's supposed to be in the box, but that's another thing. Yeah. When I look back, in 20 years, I moved uh, four times or five times. And uh, that would be four years at a time average, you know. You carry your stuff around uh, <laughs> that many times, you know. You don't know where they're at. Sometimes you're still in the box by the fourth year and you move again. And uh, it's a good thing I had I had a chance to uh, go, uh, you know, both years, 78 to 85, uh, less than full time. Uh -huh. I was working and able to uh, request to uh, FHA program and uh, bought a two acres and house on it. And, and so we got a little place where I could store some things I don't have to carry it around, you know. So there's a bunch of stuff there. The other day I was going through, but you know, a mouse got in it and had a big hole in those big, I mean, oh. book stacked like that. Yeah. So a lot of stuff gets ruined when you kept moving like that. Oh, yeah. So uh, that's the sad part about moving here and there. You know. Anyway, so much for that. Is that, I think, pretty much over? Yeah. yeah. Is it over? Yeah. <laughs>